good size audience. So we had about 4,000 there, and we had we rent these movie theaters. We had over 50 movie theaters where people come. Um, and they pay 35 bucks and get some food, and they sit and watch what you're seeing there, but in the in the movie theater, and they get the 12 CDs and all that stuff, which includes Internet Explorer. Three point zero. The big theme is the active controls. The ability to do live web pages with the audio, video, rich behavior with any any different kind of programming tool. But we showed our Java compiler, we showed our Java interpreter, we showed uh, I think a dozen new things that we're doing. So, uh, what brings you here? <laughs> I've never been here before. <laughs> I wanted to see what it was like. That's a good reason. Well, I, you didn't quite get the tour. I'm sure, hopefully, we have time to give you the tour on the way back. It's you interesting could, to see how LiveWire is like, oh, how LiveWire is like, oh, it's like a, everybody out in one room. That's an interesting way of doing it. It goes on forever, too. It's a couple miles back there. <laughs> you can <didn't> quite see. <laughs> I never yeah, seen it. It's not scaling. It worked when we were sort of in about a third of that space, and it sort of worked when we were in twice the space, in half the space. I think we're at the sense now that it's maybe a little bit too many people in one room. But you see that a lot when you go to Japan, where people are, are in a space like that. It's sort of like a, uh, a city a city newsroom where you have you know, a lot of journalists together, but I think at this point it's actually too many. I was sort of under the impression you wanted to talk a little bit about your internet strategy first, and then we were going to we were going to launch some questions at you. Is that not true? Should we just? Well, I'm glad to talk about it. I mean, our internet strategy is sort of our Windows strategy, our Windows NT strategy, our Office strategy. It's there's basically not some partitioned set of Microsoft activities called internet, and then some non-internet kind of things. It'd be hard to think of something that's not that we're doing today that's not internet related. I mean, even our games are internet multiplayer games. And certainly the vast majority of the stuff went on in the operating system. And it's just, you know, we've decided to have the HTML browser and the control framework be the primary working set of the operating system. So the shell is built on top of that. Directory display is built on top of that. Help is built on top of that. So you just have that in your standard working set. People want to do dialogues, rich forms. It's all just using the extended HTML is the way to get at that. When you want to have rich behaviors and events, you use these active control interfaces to do it. Um, and we've demonstrated some of the unification things where you unify mail browsing with web browsing and unify file system browsing with web browsing. And then our fastest growing business is our Windows NT business, the server business that includes back office. And so we just shipped Internet Information Server, what, a month ago uh, on the Internet. This is now a standard feature. How are you going to um, pull Titan into the, into the Internet? Well, that's server. called Media Server. Yeah. And so that's an add on that runs on top of Windows NT for people who want to do audio and video delivery. It, you see, you can do streaming with non-guaranteed delivery, or you can have a system where you have guaranteed delivery because you're working across a transport where you have quality of service guarantees. And, and the media server, although it works in both environments, uh, it was really, the initial design point was where you have quality of service guarantees. Like inside of one cable company? One cable no, no, ATM. ATM. AT ATM is a packet delivery network that has quality of service guarantees. That's why you can deliver voice. So that you can deliver reliable, high quality voice. Uh, and the, the IETF proposals for TCP next generation include taking advantage of what's in the ATM underneath. Uh, 
to give you the quality of service. But if you really want to have video, audio, if you really want to have people drop, there's a call private WANs where they have all these leased lines to do their corporate data delivery. You've got to have the quality of service guarantee. So it's a big milestone that's coming sometime on the web. And it'll start, it'll start in some subset of the web, but eventually it'll be pervasive. What will be pervasive? What was quality of service guarantees? Quality of service, okay. The ability to say, I want to take a move, send this much data at this rate from this point on the globe to this point on the globe, and have all the switches that are in between reserve enough bandwidth mm -hmm. to guarantee that it gets there in real time. So whether it's just a, a voice conversation, guarantee that there's no interruption or a movie that you're watching, or just a set of critical corporate data that you want to get across and make sure there's no traffic jam mm -hmm. when it's get there. You pay a little bit of a premium to get the service guarantees. Right now, the current Cisco routers don't have the rich enough ATM software to do this, and there's some standards that have to be set. But fundamentally, the Cisco routers, which are most of the, the fabric here, it's just a, a small question of software to get them upgraded to do. Is that software that Microsoft will be providing? Uh, some of it. I mean, the ATM form, which Tim Kwok, who's one of our guys who's been very involved in this, that will set a lot of the, the lower level protocols, the routing protocols. And then this TCP next generation is where you'll get what that looks like on, on a Windows NT machine. So it's an extension to the sockets uh, interface that we have today. And then the applications just, just take advantage of it. But I mean in the sense of Microsoft getting the business of trying to provide that, that kind of a guarantee? Well, most of it will be ship, ship bundled with ATM routers. Okay. The, the low level stuff that says, have I over guaranteed? Am I billing this guy properly for making the guarantee? That kind of thing. There, there's software though, when, you, when you're running on a machine and you want, you want to make sure something can run at a certain performance level. There's actually very complex scheduling algorithms to be able to say, if I, when I run this multimedia application, I want to shut out anything that might run and starve my CPU, disk access, network access, so that this thing can't make its, its guaranteed. It's called demand-based scheduling. And so you have to get, even the, the machines themselves have to have this concept of dealing with real-time data types in order to make all sorts. So there are some operating extensions that we do, but those are just, just end up being built into NT. You were um, talking about the pervasiveness of your internet strategy, and I'm curious as to how that relates to MSN, and then how the MSN then relates to the moves that you're making in the media business. Well, our, you think of Microsoft as being four businesses. We're in the Windows business. Um, that's a very good business. We're in the server business, which is Windows NT and back office. That's, a, that's our highest growth business. Uh, and then we're in the office business, and that's a you know, more than $4 billion a year business. Those three together are over 90% of our businesses. The fourth is where you'd find everything else, which is MSN, electronic commerce, um, games, encyclopedias, the maps, a couple of the joint ventures. NBC, DreamWorks, those things. And so it's a fairly small part of our revenue um, as in, in the company. But there are the four areas. Do you see that tracking get really say five years now? Well, the server business is a, a huge growth business. I mean, you're going off a base that's close to a billion today, um, and that'll be a, a big big engine of growth. The Windows business is a growth business because we're able to provide more and more software value per PC and then as well as um, be on top of the PC growth that's taking place. The office business, even just... Are you talking about the suite, the application suite office? The, that's the third business okay. area, yeah. yeah. Well, Office includes the Office. All, the, all your applications. Yeah. applications. Well, pro those are productivity applications. We recently put Works and Publisher, which are the home-based productivity applications, into the Office group because we want to come up with packaging so that the home PC users get the mix that they want. Today, 
most of our, our business out of that market has been to people either bringing work home or are doing work in a business type setting. We haven't got much of the, uh, the home, our penetration on the home machines is quite a bit lower. And so we organized to put all the productivity uh, stuff <coughs> together there in one place. So the three big businesses that make up the 90%, they're all growing. And so when you have the fourth business, uh, the biggest part of the fourth business is actually the mouse, the pointing device. Uh, Tim business. tells us about it. It's an incredible that. business. I mean, it's immensely profitable. That's the group that did the Microsoft keyboard, the Microsoft joystick, and um, actually one of the hottest products we're doing uh, later this year is a next generation mouse uh, type. So why aren't you putting a couple hundred million dollars into those other growing businesses instead of into NPC? That's, that's one of the questions I have. Well, we're not capital constrained. We've never been capital constrained. Well, I would never <laughs> say you were. No, so I mean, money is no limit to anything we're doing. We're, we're, we've always been in a hiring mode where we're looking to hire as many as many good people as we can. And that's the only, that's the operative constraint on the new things we do. And plus, which what do we think are are the operative our focus people? Hiring them. people, sure. I mean, there's a limit in terms of what we think our focus is. Our primary focus is building high volume software products, and you know that's a business with plenty of opportunities, plenty of challenges, very fast moving global uh, business. That if you get if you understand the economics and do the right things, it can be a very profitable business. Like a lot of businesses, it's one where unless you're a high volume player, it's a tough business, so you want to get your innovation and things up. Uh, so you either are number one or you're dreaming of being number one in terms of volume and all the categories that you're in. But there's a lot of things you know we've chosen not to do. We've chosen not to be in the services business. Uh, so although we have Microsoft Consulting, that's just to help uh, educate people and get design wins for the high volume software products. We're not an Anderson or an EDS. We're not in the hardware business, the chip business, the communications business. And most content areas, you know, 95%, we've also chosen not to be in. There's a few that we have chosen to be in, like encyclopedias. And we've done, and Carta's done very well in terms of profitability and market share. In fact, it's done well enough that we were now, will be the first encyclopedia that's in a lot of different languages. So we're doing the Japanese version, which is a, a $30 million investment, in French, German, Spanish. And it's, it's a lot more than translation. I mean, there's a different sense of what's important, or even a different version of the same event that are fairly important to, to provide. So. But how does the MSN seems like it's a pretty big initiative for Microsoft. And so it, it seems like that, like you guys might be looking at that as being one of your leading into at least one of your high volume software businesses with the well, MSN is not a software business really it's but it's a the content foundation club. okay and so there'll be a set of content that's under the MSN banner um, that we hope we can get lots of subscribers to we we said when we launched it that we hope to get a million in the first year and we'll clearly exceed exceed that we're at 850,000 and, and why do you want subscribers well, that's the income stream. It's just like, why do you want subscribers? But you, all the money is from the subscribers, so the more sure. the better. But you said that you, were, you saw yourself as a high volume software seller, and that's yeah. that's and a different business than having subscribers. No, actually, the way we think of a Windows customer, um, we think of the ongoing revenue stream from a Windows customer. The way we think of an Office customer is we think of an ongoing revenue okay. stream from that customer. So it's the notion of recurring revenues is. <coughs> central to the, the key businesses that we're in. MSN is different in that the value proposition is not just pure software, but includes a lot of, a lot of content as well. Mm -hmm. Now in a certain weak sense, a product like Office, the you know, spell checker, the help files, the documentation, you could call that content. There's no black and white notion of what's in, in one bucket there. But MSN is, is taking a programming budget and you know we give Russ a big programming budget and he does uh, some things internally and some things externally and he'll create a set of exclusive content that we hope subscribers find attractive. And it's a very straightforward business model. 
it's an unproven business model in a certain sense because the world is changing away from an access plus content uh, being coupled together, which has been the classic online model, to a model where access and content are two different purchase decisions. Now, it won't change overnight. It won't ever be black and white. But fundamentally, it, 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 is, it is going through that shift. Can you talk about how the importance of control of content or at least very strong influence over content is to the future of Microsoft, all the businesses? Well, the main content tool we offer is Microsoft Word. Um, and well, people content. write basically whatever they want. We support every letter of the alphabet um, and every, every language um, is possible. So people have written some very good things with Microsoft Word <laughs> and some very bad things. Uh, and we exercise no control whatsoever. Uh, we're in the tools business. And you're never going to be saying you're in the media business as we end up in the entertainment business. Well, we make Flight Simulator, which is the, the you know, long running uh, uh, game that's sold very well. For the news business. Well, through our joint venture, you know, we chose not to do news on our own. We did, we, I don't know if you've ever used MSN News, um, but they did a very good job producing that. But we chose, we decided that unless, you know, in terms of the scale involved and the skill set involved, that it only made sense as part of the long run strategy to do that with NBC really driving the activities. But that's national. I understand that Microsoft is planning a many city initiative called Cityscape that's going to be local news for MSN. That'll be not, that's not time. news. News is not that's, part of Cityscape. It's not? No. What is it? What, what's involved in Cityscape? <laughs> well, that's the problem with denying false rumors. Then you, have to, <laughs> you have to explain what it is. We, we're, we're working on a, a thing that uh, relates to local information, local events, what to do. Oh, okay. There's a hundred, hundreds of companies working on this. But it's, um, it's content. It's editorial content. No, it's content, but it's not news. We won't have beat reporters going and saying that somebody, you know, shot their dog. We, you know, we'll say here's a restaurant, here's a uh, local park activity. It's it's local it's, activity it's space. Kind of um, but you know, we're one of, of hundreds of people who are looking at, at that business and what they could do uh, there. The dominant player there will certainly be the the newspapers who can hybridize across the print-based revenue stream and the, and the electronic. Well, it's interesting to me that, that you're really downplaying the importance of media when there's a whole new campus on Microsoft built for it and wonderful it's digital all production. It's all on campus. Well, no, it's, it's, uh, no, it's no, we Red, West, is, Red West isn't right next door to the main campus. No, it's about a mile away. It's, yeah. it, you can call it a separate campus if you want. We tell them they're on the main campus. <laughs> they don't believe you. <laughs> Mostly they don't, but they actually, they're, they, what they have is a little bit nicer than the, the buildings pretty where we nice, are. Pretty nice, yeah. Babbling brooks. So, so, so it seems like it's a pretty serious thing. Well, right? that, you know, we call it the interactive media division, the stuff that works for Patty Stone Cypher. Um, and so that fourth area, um, actually now the mouse doesn't, the hardware input exactly. device group doesn't work for her and electronic commerce doesn't work for her. But otherwise, except for those two exceptions, everything I put into the fourth area works for Patty. But those are investments where we're trying to do new things. You know, we're taking a risk. Will we do well? The barriers to entry for publishing on the internet, as you know, are, are almost nil. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have the number of entrants into any category will be truly overwhelming. And you've got a truly unproven business model uh, for being out there. I don't know many people who are making a lot of profitability today, but you know, we're, we're, we think we can do some cool things, we'll try some different things. But in terms of what's proven about the future of Microsoft, that is the least proven part of the company. Uh, you know, Encarta's great, Automap's great, you know, we've done some really neat titles, uh, but it's not, the, it's not the scale of business uh, that those others are. Do you think that it'll get there? I mean, let's just dream for a second. I mean, let's just say everything works and everybody figures out how to use the, how to make money on the internet. That actually becomes a publishing platform. Is that something you'd like to see happen at Microsoft? Would you like to see 
your media stuff bring in as much money as your application software? Oh, there's not a chance. The applications business is a four billion dollar a year business. Well, media is a pretty big business too. Not Inter important. Interactive not. media, maybe not, but media is a well, big business. First of all, it's interactive media. We're only doing a few content things, and even those are unproven. So it's hard to say. I mean, uh, how do you get to four billion dollars in interactive media? What advertising? Four billion dollars? Anyway, I mean, it's 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 not reasonable to contemplate those activities being larger than our applications group um, in this decade, in the next 10 years, let's say. A local uh, newspaper advertising, $40 billion business in America now. Print. Print. Yeah. yeah. So some chunk of that could be worth $4 billion. Okay, say 100 people go into that business. <laughs> but only so many of them have distribution monopolies. Of but on the internet, right? in the internet, everybody has distribution. Well, maybe for another six months. I mean, but no, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, there's getting to be so much stuff that that companies are going to have to start aggregating, and that's part of the business model for MSN is to be a club where you can go. No, no, no advertiser-based stuff always has distribution. There's nothing that blocks advertisers' supported material from having pure distribution. Well, except that if there's four gazillion websites, yeah, yeah. advertisers virtual, can't support them. That's one, and then there's but, also. But who? I don't understand. Who who wins that? That's our question. That's the question. Okay. Whoever, I don't think whoever has. I don't have any particular advantage in, in that. Well, yeah, you do because you have a brand, and you're on 85 percent of the desktops in the world. And you have an entry point. I mean, it's like Windows is on those desktops. I mean, yeah. Is that guaranteed the success of even application software that we do? No. I mean, it's silly to think that. Has anything to do no. with the success of what we're doing in the content world? How long did it take MSM to get to be ten times the business we have taken from years ago? Oh come on, Genie. Well, I mean, Genie is a shrinking thing. I mean, yeah, why? your your bridge club will be bigger than Genie soon. I agree. I agree. <laughs> why? But why? But the reality why? Is within, yeah. <laughs> see, I found that desktop is better than I don't think that's arguable. Oh, you think that it, it, we're not getting customer? We we bought an ad. Uh, which is an icon on the desktop. The majority of MSN users didn't know that icon was there. But anyway, what? some of them, some how, of them. How? How, how do you know? Just right there on the screen. Because we do a survey. So how'd they get on there? How'd, how'd they find their way there? By right, some other? Uh, through the install procedure. I mean, That's okay. The current model, the current model. MSN is in three places. It's in the install <laughs> procedure, it's on the program menu, and it's on the no, desktop. Right. But, but on the, the dev, that was shipped to me. As soon as I turned it on, it was the hard disk, and then there was the MSN icon. What, what percentage of PCs do you think with AOL coming up as their primary thing? We are, we are uh, go buy consumer PCs and see which online service gets most prominent mention. We will be a distant fourth. When you we take a Packard Bell machine, Navigator comes up, not Windows, and promotes the hell out of CompuServe. Not us. We are the least prominent online server in terms of the experience you get in an out-of-the-box PC. Well, yeah, you're pretty new, though, too. I mean, that's going to have to change. We're not getting our subscribers because we're on the Windows desktop. The Microsoft brand is helping us get some of those subscribers. Now, how far can that go? But it's helping us get some of those. We're Microsoft, so you know, a lot of those people are actually using other online services, and they signed up for ours. It's not very expensive. I remember, this is like uh, you get into the trial period, and even if you pass the trial period, which about 80% of those people have, what is it, 10 bucks? I mean, you know, it's fun to sample the thing. You want to tell your friends, yeah, it's still not any good. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see Microsoft staying in the ISP business? We're not in, we're only in that in the sense that we offer customers access plus content through an arrangement we have with UUNet where we fund them putting in points of presence. And so we've been careful not really to get directly in that. Most of our business for the next two or three years will probably be access plus content. Over time, we expect the content only SKU to be popular, to be the most popular. But your, your idea is to build up so that you keep having these subscribers come back for more access plus content, or are you trying to, are you hoping that they buy tools, software tools? So, software tools is a completely separate business. Okay, so, so you would like to have more and more subscribers buying 
access for his content and from you. Russ Siegelman wants to have that. That's his job. He runs MSN. But the he wakes up every morning and thinks about subscribers times subscription fee equals plus ad revenue equals revenue. Do you ever think that could become a very large business as big as application, sales of applications? How, I mean, do the math. Let's say, we had, let's say we had 20. Uh, let's say we had 20. If you do the math, it'd be a very large business. Seriously? What do you think the annual pure content fee for those people would be? For, for which people? For them, what annual for the, for the what user? annual content only fee would they pay? Would a subscriber pay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a couple hundred dollars a year. No, not a chance in hell. Wait, Wait, what what is the cable, the cable. Thirty bucks. How much is cable making? Very different. Why? Why? Especially if it's all, the same thing. It's, it's subscribers, it's subscribers, and, and content plus access. This is, this is big business, Bill. I think First of all, I asked story. only about I only asked about the content business. You have to understand that we we're a pass through on the access part of that. That's just a cost of goods sold. We don't make any margin on the access part. We're just doing that to be able to offer what people want to buy today, which is like what AOL says, where you have access plus content. So don't talk about the access piece because that just goes to buy Cisco routers, Ascend modems, and. Nothing to do with me. Yeah, but you, know, you can't ask the question, how much will people pay for content? Because so much of what you guys are working on now and what everybody's working on in this space has to do not just with advertising, but lots of different subsidies. So the, the revenue... What subsidies space, besides advertising? Well, like the health database, for example. You know, people people in Microsoft are talking about having that underwritten, sort of sponsored, the way they used to That's sponsor just teams. It's a form it's, of advertising. Well, it's, it is and it's not. And what, in what sense is it not? Well, because I well no matter okay, call it whatever you want. I still it's don't advertising. Have to, I don't have to pay the money to get the content. That's so, advertising. So, and then you can charge you can charge content. I, apparently, you guys are optimistic about uh, content clubs. That's good because there's a thousand people doing content clubs. I hope all a thousand people who are doing content clubs can do well. You know, what, do you think you Disney mean? will do well? I think that they'll do extremely well. How about Wall Street Journal? I mean, there's some brands that are like. Very closely associated with a particular type of content. And how about Microsoft? Will do very well. Will Microsoft do well as a content club? No guarantee. Remember, Microsoft is the company that will never make any forecasts. We don't promote our future. We don't. So why did you we may that? fail. Why did you invest valuable people in the business then? It's only pretty good business. <laughs> There's a chance we could do well, but your notion of the numbers. You know, the notion that somebody, that anyone, take Disney, okay, who really has some real assets, brand, cross-promotion here, the notion that they could get ten, four billion dollars out of their interactive content club, just, the math does not pencil out, not in my world. It doesn't pencil out today, but... Not, there there will, will be no content be club, I can guarantee you, there will be no content club in my lifetime with four billion dollars a year of revenue. Just get real. How much does ABC make? I don't know. Disney is a twenty billion dollar company, so that's their combined revenue is a lower operation. That's their content. Their their content club is four billion. No, that's not a content club. So I don't understand if you if you don't think you're ever gonna make four billion on it, why are you doing it? Because we think it'll be profitable. Yeah, but profitable, schmoffitable. I mean, you, you, all your CD-ROM business is profitable now. No, it's not no profitable. that's not true. Our, well, actually, we have lots of CD-ROM businesses that are not profitable. Well, that's, As not, do, that's not what we have more. We have Oh, if you take them all together, they're profitable. Now she says there are very few that don't make, I mean, they're profitable. It's like this profitable. So you have to think about going to products. I'm, that not, sure, I'm not sure what measure being applied there. There are lots of those businesses that aren't very big businesses. Not in... But that's part of the that was part of the reorg and part of the reason why a lot of that portfolio stuff is going to go away and stuff like Encarta, well, the, the and Music Central, and all that stuff is, is going to become more of the kind of products that Microsoft does, broader base, more potential to have very high sales. So I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on there that that points toward. I mean, your people are saying they won't say numbers, but it's clear that you're making a big investment here. So if you can't, yeah, we could lose a lot of money. Yeah, but why are you doing it if you don't think you're going to be able to make money? Oh, we think we're going to be able to make money. But in not the past, million dollars we, in, in the past, time. we've had reasonable ability to make money. 
Well, we believe that. Well, yeah. why, why are you saying that it's not? But you're on drugs when you talk about four billion dollars. I didn't Let's say that. Let's be real. I mean, I'm an I American, literate person. Sure. Got it. Okay. Okay. I, I don't, you know, so, it's so, not a world of adjectives. It's not for numbers. It's not for the total ad spend in America is eight billion dollars. Four billion dollars of that is not a huge chunk. You know? When will when will the total internet ad spending that's not divided by the thousand people doing this thing? Uh, when will it be greater than four billion? Forrester says five billion by two thousand. Uh, four billion by when? Two thousand. Forrester says five billion by two thousand. Okay, so let's say it's five billion. Who do you? What? What do you think the company with the greatest share of that will have in terms of internet advertising revenue? So why should you call it internet advertising? You know, I think that's well, a red that? herring. I mean, why? Internet, because it's not just the internet. It's a, it's the business of delivering media content. Electronic. To you, to a consumer electronically. That's not internet advertising. That, that's a, that's okay. a new market. Take cable advertising. Who, 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 has the, who has the biggest cable advertising revenue? U.S. Individual network? Mm -hmm. uh, ESPN. ESPN, 250 million. Is that 4 billion? I don't think so. Anyway. Yeah, that's one brand. Yeah. Now, how many brands do you think I'm going to have? I'm not doing ESPN on the I'm not doing sports. I mean, uh, I, I think we can be profitable. I do think we can be profitable. We're only doing this stuff because we think we can be profitable. And we're going to try four or five of those things. You won't even admit that you're doing it because it's possible this could, could be a next media revolution that you want to have. It won't, it won't be bigger than our other businesses in any reasonable time frame. You know, the, the, we're, we're dancing on this question of whether it's going to be bigger than your existing businesses, but the real question, I think, is uh, will Microsoft be a dominant player in this new media? Uh, there, I don't think by any, any means they'll be a dominant player. There's no distribution friction here. So the amount of specialization, this will make the magazine business look like a, a very uh, dominated business. The variety of titles and activities on the internet. All you have to do is own a PC and buy, buy a copy of Front Page, whatever your favorite authoring tool it is. It's because of the ease of entry. You know, take network TV, cable TV, magazines, books. Um, this has a lower cost of entry than books. And so take each of those businesses and look at the largest, second largest, third largest. Go down. This will be more distributed than, than books is, more, you, more it, spread out. It used to have the lowest cost of entry, but it gets more and more sophisticated as you move down the road and add different media types as you start to get Brand is the only, the only barrier is brand awareness, just establishing brand awareness. And, the, and this thing will niche incredibly. And remember, there's a thing that underlines it, which is free information publishing, which will be you know, extremely widespread on the internet. Free information publishing? What do you mean? Yeah. No, That's people it. who just choose to put up information for free. But again, there's no barrier to entry, virtual no barrier to entry to making magazines, and yet there are only two or three or four or five magazine companies that are, that are dominant that take away probably 60 to 80 percent of the revenue in the business. That's right? not true. Yes, it I is. mean, no, I have the chart. I know for all these businesses how aggregated they are. What you said is not even close to true. The Hearst, the Condé Nast, the Time Warners. Oh, um, yeah. and the zips. I well, mean, let's they, see. They, there's a country, there's a country called Japan. Let's see. There's a place called Europe. Uh, hmm, I don't think it's quite accurate what you said. I don't think even in the U.S. it's close to the truth. I mean, it is a very distributed business. Take the top 100 magazines. How many magazine companies? I'm talking about revenues of all. Top 100 revenues. What's the question? How many magazine companies represented by the top 100 magazines? Well, I don't know. Well, 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 I find well, this slightly disingenuous because you keep comparing this to old media, and, it, and what the point is with all of this is that you could say that you were in the media business today if all you had was MSN and not a title because you're a distribution medium, and you can you can. It's you a club. It's a content club. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you it's keep like saying a record that. Club. I don't know what that you know. I mean, it's like a record it's club. A, it's also a distribution medium. A record club is a distribution medium. Okay, so so there are lots of different ways that Microsoft can make money. I don't know if this is how you would account for it, but there's lots of different ways for Microsoft to make money in the media business, having to do with um, having um, independent content providers, 
um, be part of the MSN label, club, whatever you want to call it. There's lots of different ways to configure this so that you aren't necessarily making money only on the media that you produce in the digital backlog. But if what you're trying to get to is, we will not be one of the top 10 media companies, even let's take Mary Mira, just the US. To get to we won't even be close to being one of the top 10 media companies. I mean, not within a million miles. We're not even going, to, if we were successful in every area we're going after, and even just take the US, we wouldn't be one of the top 10 media companies. In interactive so, media? In interactive media, we might be. Well, you're probably there now. It, well, the, the, numbers are, the numbers are nothing uh, today. I mean, how much ad revenue is there out there? We, we're one of the biggest spenders in terms of uh, running internet ads. We're going to run, what, this 12 month period, $12 million of internet ads. But, you know, that's. But media, media and content are essential to your future growth. In terms of uh, running internet ads, we're going to run, what, this 12 month period, $12 million of internet ads. But, you know, that's. But media, media and content are essential. To your future growth, no, uh, for the rest of the business, not no. not necessarily content that you're producing. In oh, in the same sense. way that at the same way so, that so writing. That's why I talked about not only controlling that content but influencing that content, and more you can influence the big media companies to go in a direction to that improve tools. the rest of your business. To tie them to your tools. But you never no, you never control. make money just selling to a few big media companies. They, how much? What do you think the tools no, budgets can, of the big media we can companies are? The big media companies to sell to everybody else. And the browser business. Well, that's a good business. That's zero times a number. It's a hell of a business. <laughs> and that's something you see. Why are you being so, so uh, aggressive and you see it as a threat to the future of your OS? That's a feature of the operating system. That's our strategy. That, that is a threat to the future of the ability to view media. I mean, from the desktop to view media, you need that capability built into your operating system. Do you agree with that? No, you can run the Netscape browser. No, I'm saying, but you're obviously very aggressive in, 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 in supporting, you know, creating your brand for your browser. You're not because it's, we're promoting that feature of our operating system very heavily. No, well, I think what Russ, what you're saying is the ability to, to access media through the screen is very important as part of your OS, right? That's a feature that users will expect. Now, and the more you link up with big media companies to share revenues as it grows. Uh, you're going to you're gonna increase your revenue through the content. I don't and understand. Influence. You don't, you get no, when you sell people tools, you get zero, zero of their revenue. When you sell people windows, you get zero of the money they no, spend on doing things. You, you get need, no, none of that money. You need, you need, you need well, to, you need to influence. Not a concept. chance in hell. You'd never be competitive. You'd be put out of business in a second. It's like saying, this piece of paper, you using my piece of paper, pay us a royalty. Netscape, you use that piece of paper to do something really cool. Netscape does it right now. They they have advertising on their uh, on their browser. They no, sell, they, sell they have ads. advertising on their home page. Well, which most people don't change. So they they end up with what a billion hits a week now, something like that. No, we'll have a home. Our browser will point to a home page. Now we let people. We have all these deals where people distribute our browser for free, and they can change the home page. So, but, the, but the truth is that the tools that you guys are developing bifurcate a little bit from, in the same way that Netscape's do right now, They're, they have they have things that they can do with their servers and their browsers that are slightly different from if you don't have the Netscape browser. So Microsoft is doing something a little bit different. No, we're supersetting the Netscape well, browser. And will you continue to superset the Netscape Absolutely. browser? So there will never come a point in time when if I am using Internet Explorer, I will see something better or more fully featured than if I'm using the Netscape browser well, clone to us. the same thing. Pardon me? They'll clone us. We'll clone them, they'll clone us. That's the name of the game. Unless you come out with a feature that nobody uses, well, then they won't bother to clone you. Yeah, but love that's that. the name of the game. It's just like the spreadsheet business. But but I guess what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to get to, and I think what Russ is too, is that it's not just about the media that you create in-house and, and getting that subsidized through advertising or whatever. There's a whole system that Netscape and AOL and everybody's trying to do here. Everybody, you, you're talking. You're calling AOL's AOL's not in the tools business. I'm well, totally well, confused. Well, the intersection between AOL and Netscape is nil. 
No, 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 that's not true. If your content What's the overlap writer, between AOL and Netscape? There's, there's an explosion in new media. The point is that And you, they're going to use computers and they're going to use tools. And if you can lock them into your standards, you're going to do very well. That's the... We... <laughs> Here's a point. There's a thing called specialization. And the tools business is totally competitive. There are tons and tons of tool companies. And you don't get any influence over any other part of the business by being successful in tools. None. You get no, no revenue from the other parts of the business. You get the tools revenue. That's it. Period. But it's all soft. I mean, it's, the delivery is going to be dependent on software. And if you can control the software standards, you can reap the benefits of that no. media exposure. No. It's like saying that because you deliver electricity or something. I mean, you... Well, how, how does that work? I don't understand. Are tools part of your four billion dollar apps business? No. What is that? Where does that fall in the? Floor? That's in the Windows business. That's in the Windows business. It's a small business, you understand. The entire tools business, because you never get royalties. People just buy a copy of the tool. I mean, you know, they're they're not they're not big tools companies in this world. With the electronics consumer goods explosion, you, you mentioned electricity. If governments didn't, and I'm not saying you should be regulated, but if governments didn't regu regulate the providers of elect that electricity, their, their profits would have been obscene. I and mean, they, they, you know, the standard was set for the explosion of, of consumer, electronic no, consumer there, there there was a monopoly local distribution network, which you don't have in any of the businesses we're in. Well, you've got a pretty good lock on operating system. No. Let's say we didn't enhance Windows. How long, let's say I didn't do any new versions. How long would Windows be popular? How about 10 years from now? Do you think I'd sell any copies? I'm not saying you don't deserve it. That no, room. I'm just asking you. Want do we have a lock? Can I go? Can I go take a vacation? No, but you're making tremendous profits on it now. And if you can, if you can get a temporary lock on, uh, the only by keeping it completely along. open to all content and making it browse all content and charging no royalty for anybody ever using that. Only that's that's but what see, we but do. But that's for, that's the perfect way to do it, though. I mean, what, that's charge what, not, but, nothing. But no, you, what you do is you keep. You keep growing. I mean, we're we're not trying to accuse you of anything here. This is about you know keeping. But I get no part of the media business building. because of Windows. None. You get what? No part of the media business because of Windows. What if it's the it's the delivery platform? How can you say? Well, I get the Windows royalty, but I don't get any part of what people are spending on media. If they put if 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 content providers put their content on MSN, you do. That's that's in that fourth area of business. Well, right. Which is based on your Microsoft brand name, by the way. Sure. Your ability to deliver subscribers. I mean, That's I, right. There are multiple companies with brand names. Um, I remember the presentation that we had for Microsoft Network before it launched, and they were saying that the way they were going to make money was to take a little bit of transaction. That was the original model. When we came here, they presented that that was the operating model, was that they were going to take a little bit of everybody's uh, transactions. Well, if you, our strategy for Microsoft Network has changed uh, because of the, the internet being at the center of gravity. So if you go far, back, far enough back, the presentation we're getting was sort of a classic online service business model, mm -hmm. which now is not our model. Because that, that model... Well, if the model's just splintered, there's about five different ways for you guys to make money on it. No, it's a different model. It's a completely different model. What's the model now? The old model is a middleman model where you control what content appears to people. No one can bootstrap that at this stage. Nobody can do a, a new online service. And so now the model is it's we have to have unique content that we fund out of a programming budget and hope that we get enough subscribers times subscription fee plus advertising to pay for that programming budget. So because we're betting on the future, we pick a programming budget, a good sized programming budget, spend some of it internally, some of it externally, and you know, we're pretty early in that stage, uh, and we hope that we can get enough subscribers to make that a, a profitable business. But we're not a middleman. No customers are able to go out and browse anything. The information that we put on MSN is not the only information they see. In the old online service model, you got to control all the information that that customer saw. And so it's tough to make money on transactions. I mean, we may try and make a little bit, but you know, say somebody's selling an airline ticket, marketing up $10. How long does it take me to put up a service 
Just buy off the shelf Microsoft Commerce Server, put up a service that sells it for $5 or $1 markup fee. You know, the, the, it's friction free because all the tools, all the pieces are so easy for somebody to assemble. So nobody's going to be sitting there making much of a markup on anything. So the future looks pretty good for you. No, the only guaranteed winner here is the customer in terms of what they they'll be able to get out of this thing. They're in good shape. What about the what about the ad phone model in combination with TCI and setting up high speed proprietary networks and then uh, cutting companies in to sit on the servers at the distribution points? I'm not I don't I don't think if you read the telecom DREG bill they're allowed to do what you just described. Why not? Because they their pipe has to be open. Well, they could have it open. Right? Well, it doesn't have to be very big. But they don't, yeah, I mean, they could they could go to the net uh, T1 speeds and have you know 10 megabit speeds internally. Which is exactly what they're talking about. And so then, well, there, so then the there is there is either you can call it monopoly or duopoly in terms of high speed local access between the cable and phone companies. And if those those guys may be in good shape because that's a very unique asset that it's just too expensive for other people to go in and duplicate. An overbuild has not been an attractive proposition. So but what does that do to the idea that everybody has access to everybody in this network? Uh, well, not they, they different. They theoretically have it, access, it, it, but the experience is entirely different with the speed that you're getting it at. I'm, I'm not sure how that will play out. Um, you know, we're not. We're not involved in that. We're not in the connectivity business. Are you going to play on that home or is Microsoft's product going to end up there? Because we'll be one of the supplicants. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there, there will be at least a thousand people in that line. I know John Wald's phone number. <laughs> well, these three people are wrapped with because we're running out of time. Um, I got a question about uh, silicon graphics. Well, actually, about the, the uh, graphics yeah. talent that you've been tracking from. Uh, uh, many labs and other places. Um, why, why do these people not want to go to Silicon Graphics? Do you think? How did you uh, lure them away? You have to ask them. I mean, we we started hiring high-end graphics talent over three years ago, and well, talk about Silicon Graphics then, and how how uh, you see that competitive. Well, they're in the hardware business. They make their own microprocessor called the MIPS microprocessor, and they're in the hardware business. We're not in the hardware business. They are, they're sort of in the systems business, the hardware soft combination business. It's one of those weird asymmetries where if their entire volume of business shifted over to Microsoft tomorrow, it would be a rounding error. I mean, because of our business model, the dollars per user that we get is just so much tinier uh, than theirs is. So it's not like we think of Silicon Graphics as a competitor. In a pure technological sense, now we want to make available in a $700 PC graphics that are better than you can get on a 200,000 SDI machine uh, today, but that's, that's the way of the world. That's the, the marching army of, of the PC industry moving up to new levels of graphics performance or uh, processor performance. And so we, we made a huge investment hiring a bunch of people, some of whose names are known today because uh, they're famous from work they did previously, like Alvy Ray or Nick Clay or uh, Jim Kaji or Dan Ling or uh, the guys at Soft Homage, or the people that they helped us hire, whose names will be known in the future, to come up with some radical ways of looking at graphics, uh, the software architecture for graphics, and then use conferences like our Windows Hardware Engineering Conference to let hardware developers know how to do do graphics that our software can take advantage of. So in, in a lot of areas, linguistics, database, graphics, security, we've had enough success to take a very long-term view and hire an incredible uh, set of people so that PCs uh, and Windows in particular can be very strong in that area. So we're, we're not really in any sense competing with Silicon Graphics. If we happen to make the PC good fast enough, it could change their business. Uh, but there's no one at Microsoft that wakes up in the morning and thinks, oh, silicon, silicon graphics. There are people who wake up and think Netscape browsers, uh, Lotus Notes, uh, Oracle databases. 
Nobel lampware still. Oh, yeah, I could keep him here for hours. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering if you're happy with Bob. Bob who? <laughs> Bob Purple? No, Bob, that, that, that Bob. software agent software that you brought out at CES. To... I still believe in, in social interface. The sales of Bob have been very disappointing compared to what we expected. Um, but we're investing very heavily in social interface. This whole idea of. Uh, you mean like uh, chat? No. Well, VChat it has some of those things. So, social interface is, is fundamentally about building a profile of the user. Uh, and we use what's called Bayesian inference technology underneath to build up a profile and, and be able to help the user in the future. We still believe in that very strongly. And you'll see more products from us. There's a new version of Bob being done that we think will do a lot better. Jim. Uh, no, it's Bob 2.0. <laughs> uh, we're, we're keeping the name. And you'll see a lot of other products from us with social user interface, particularly as you get to voice input into the machine. The notion of one place that you, you have the focus that you interact with becomes increasingly important. As you can put more tracking behind that, that makes sense. And there's a lot of things that have failed in the marketplace that I still believe in. PDAs have failed. I believe in them, and we're investing super heavily. Handwriting has failed. You know, no one in this meeting, we're supposed to be computer people. No one, we don't take our notes on computers. We will. Uh, and we're investing uh, very heavily in that. Social user interface. It was premature. It did better than Windows 1.0 did. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> no, it, it's just an example that patience can pay off. Oh, you or you can call it pick You actually have a machine translation. Well, the natural, the, our natural language group, when you move, when you move to understand the semantics of language, then you can translate it. Our focus is not translation. Our focus is understanding. If you have a group that does understanding, you could spin off a translation. Did you guys have an investment in NLI? Yeah, we bought NLI. You bought NLI. I wonder 100%. what happened. You also hired a I wonder what happened. You also hired the team from IBM. That's right. Karen Jensen was hired five years ago, and that was uh, cool George Heiner. Well, there's there's the coolest stuff. Um, we, we, have, we have a great voice recognition group, we have a great natural language group. Our, our research group is, done, done, do, is doing some fun things. How is that going to work with Bob 2.0? Is I'm Bob, sorry? Bob 2.0 going to have hooks into MSN? I mean, that's going to be great for, oh, for that's the email. Be great for, the, for web stuff. Building a profile, that would be cool. Well, the email from Bob will connect with MSN. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's part of some large, large scale scheme, though. Okay. Did you want to take a quick tour? Uh, since, that's, since, that, since that's what you No, I can't. Okay. We have to come back. Next again. time. I'll yeah. definitely be back. Thanks, Bill.